you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis. Genesis, as we begin a new series on Sabbath, this is going to be fun. And this probably will be my favorite message of the series because I love looking at the beginning of the Sabbath, looking at the original design and purpose. And this is really exciting. Uh, If you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, starting with verse 1, the Word of God says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because, because he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for this special opportunity to study your word. We thank you for this beautiful Sabbath message that we are about to hear, and may it be a revelation and a comfort and really grasp at its core the original design and purpose of the Sabbath. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen and amen. So real quick here, um, we're going to be learning some new things about the Sabbath, and it's a four-part series, so please, please wait until we get through the series. We're not going to preach everything about the Sabbath today. I know afterwards people are going to come up to me and say, but pastor, just chill. No emails. Just, we're going to get through it. We're going to talk about the Sabbath in its many different uh, iterations and, and, and throughout time and the purpose and meaning it had in different seasons of, of Earth's history. And, uh, but today we're going to talk about the Sabbath at the very beginning. So in chapter 1, in chapter 1 of Genesis, at the very beginning, verse 1, it says that, that in the beginning God created. You guys know these texts so well, we're not even going to put them on the screen, that God created. His first introduction to us is as creator. In the beginning, God created. God created. And we learn that God created on the first day. He created light in verse 4. And it says that, that it was good. The light was good. In verse 10, it says that God called the dry ground land, and he gathered the waters, and he called them seas, and it was good. He saw that it was good. On the third day, on the fourth day, he's creating birds and bees and he's creating fish and African cichlids, all the stuff that we love. Believe it or not, I'm an Aquarist. I have a lot of African cichlids. I love looking at them. They, they bring me a lot of peace. And then we, we read on in verse 12 that he also has the lamb produce vegetation. Um, we have in verse 12 where the, 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 the plants that everything that he had gathered, it was all good and he says that it was good. We go down to further on in the the Genesis account in chapter 1, and we have God on the sixth day creating bunnies and puppies and kittens and cows and chickens before we ate them. I must say that. Chapter 2, the Bible tells us that God created animals for Adam's companionship. Not for consumption. Do I need to say that again? Verse 29 of chapter 1, he tells us what our diet is. We are to eat the vegetables and the, and the fruits, the legumes, the nuts, all that other good stuff. That is, that is the OG diet. I call that the original garden diet, the OG diet. And it was good for mankind. All of it was good. At the end of the sixth day, God creates Adam. He creates man, both male and female. Chapter 2 gives us a little bit more of a narrative around it, that after he had created Adam, he said it wasn't good for him to be alone. So he, he put him into a deep sleep, and from his side, he crafted Eve and brought them together that they may become one. God gives Adam and Eve in chapter 1 the first commandments, his very first instructions, be fruitful and multiply. That wasn't a hard commandment for them to receive. It was natural. It was already in their DNA. They were wired biologically to do this. He tells them to tend to the garden, to care for it, to rule over the beast, all of the animals, the fish and the birds of the sky. 
These were their instructions. And it was good, and it was good. He does this in six literal days. I need to say this because that's what my Bible says. My Bible says there was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening, there was morning the second day. There was evening, there was morning the third day. It, it, it's speaking about 24-hour periods. And I always, always get a kick out of people that say, but that makes no scientific sense. You must see these days as, as dispensations of time. One day could have been billions of years. But that's not what the Bible says. Well, then you just are believing in a fantasy. And it's so interesting that people have a hard time reconciling science and their understanding of evolution with creation, but they don't have the same problem when they get to the miracles of Jesus. I never see anybody complaining about how Jesus uh, multiplied fish and bread. Nobody talks about the evolution process there. Nobody, how old were the fish when Jesus created them out of thin air? Anybody know? They looked like full-grown fish. They were even cooked. People forget that miracles cannot be explained by our understanding and grasp of science. See, God can understand it because he's, he's the inventor of all this stuff. So I never have a problem if someone says, but the world appears to be older than 6,000 years or 7,000 years. I don't care about that because when God created the birds and the bees and the trees and the mountains and the sea, and he created the sun, the moon, and the stars, how old did they look? How old did Adam and Eve look? Because he's clearly giving them instructions. He's not nursing them. He's not waiting for them to walk. They're full-grown people. Adam and Eve, because there was no death, could have looked like they were 100,000 years old. But how old were they? Seconds. So if someone looks at the sun and says, it looks older, I'm like, get over it. God, according to this creation story, creates at maturity. And because there was to be no death, no decay, there needed to be no timetable or how we mark how old something is. It didn't matter because it was going to live forever, survive forever. So anytime someone gets on your case and says it doesn't make any scientific sense, take them back to the miracles of Jesus and say, explain this with science. Well, that's different. It's a miracle. Newsflash, creation is a miracle. Hello? Creation is a miracle, and that's what we read in the Genesis account. It is a miracle. We could not do it ourselves. We cannot fully explain how it was done, and that is the definition of a miracle. If you don't like the word miracle, you can say magical, whatever works for you. It's miracle, science fiction, that works. You can't explain it, you couldn't do it, it's a God thing. Get over it. So at the end of the six days, the six literal days, again, it could look like evolution with a magnifying glass. It could look like it took trillions of years old. That's okay. My Bible says God did all of that in seconds, in minutes, in days, and we accept it because we accept what Jesus did in the Gospels. So the Bible tells us that at the end of these six days in our text, chapter 2, that God completed everything. Now, the question I have for you is, why does God create? Why does God create? Why does he create? Someone said it's who he is. Why? Who is he doing this all for? Relationship. When you're looking at the account of what God does, it's interesting in chapter 1 how he turns everything over to Adam and Eve. As soon as he creates, he gives it over to them and says, it's all yours. You rule. Wait, we didn't mean we rule. It's all of yours. No, no, no. It's all of yours. You rule. In fact, you name the animals. And you tend to the garden. In fact, you complete the process of creation by filling this earth with life. Wow. 
Even when God looks at Adam and says it's not good for you to be alone, Adam was not lonely. Adam had God, right? Adam needed to talk to somebody. He had God. And God says, no, 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 no. Yes, I'm good. We're great. We got a good relationship. But you need a suitable companion for you. Something that can happen between you and this companion that would not happen between you and I. And so I, I'm going to put you in a deep sleep and create a suitable companion for you. All throughout this creation process, God seems, believe it or not, to almost be recessed and allow mankind to celebrate and allow mankind to have dominion and allow mankind its own autonomy and allow creation to exist on its own. It's such an interesting, very interesting narrative because you would think that from the very beginning, God would show up and say, I'm creator and I deserve all the power and all the glory and all the credit and all the authority. But watch what happens in chapter two. And this is just what's going to trip us up a little bit. The Bible says that he completes everything and then he rests. Question, why does God rest? Was he tired? Was God worn out? He wasn't out of breath. God didn't need to rest because he was tired. God rested, the Bible says, very clearly because he was finished. That's it. The only reason why he rests is because he's finished. He is done. At this point, he is now pleased with the work of his hands. I'm going to say it another way. He rests because he likes you. He rests because he likes you. He says, oh, this is good. Oh, this is good, good. Oh, I'm just going to stand back, take a deep breath. I like you. Often people think of love as being the most powerful way to express our feelings for people. But you know there are people you love in life you don't like, right? Right? Don't look to the left or right right now. Don't do it. We can love someone and not like them. You know that, right? May not like their personality. They can be annoying, but we love them in Jesus. Amen? For God to get to the point where he loves us, you might think, well, that makes sense. You gave birth to us. You know, we're your kids. Yeah, you should love us. But God also delights in you. He likes you. You see, see we're not an afterthought we're a before thought before you were born I knew you meaning that before God creates in his own imagination he thought of us and says oh I want to meet her oh I'm gonna get to work right now okay I'm gonna I'm gonna dress up the baby room like this I'm gonna put some stars Yes, and kind of like a little mobile. Oh, it's going to be so great. They're going to love all the little lights I put in their room. And I'm going to do better than stuffed animals. I'm going to give them real animals. If you read the creation story, it's like God making a home for his babies. So he gets to the final day and he's finished and he sits back and, and he's only resting because he delights in the work of his hands. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that is, whew. And then watch this. This is the thing that kind of messed me up as I, as I started to study this. He had finished doing everything by the seventh day, right? He had finished his work and so he rested on it, and then it says that God then blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Question, why does he bless it and why does he make it holy, according to Scripture? Why does he bless it and why does he make it holy? <laughs> because he was finished with creating us. So he now wants to bless the day because he has finished giving birth to us. He wants to commemorate the day because it is the day that we were completed. Oh, you guys don't get this. When Nathan was born, it was a miracle. I was one of those dads who wished I could go back to like the 40s, 50s, and 60s and be like in a waiting room and wait for the doctor to come out and say, it's a boy. And I'm, oh, all right, thank you, doc. But you know, in this day and age, 
you have to go to these different classes and watch videos and be helpful and be in the actual room and, you know, pass out, right? I don't like people in pain and I don't like blood. And so I really didn't want to be around it. But, you know, Iris was pregnant and was married. Had to be there, right? The least I could do, right? Problem. Iris wanted to have Nathan in the most natural way possible. No hospitals, no intervention. She just straight up was like, we're going to have midwives and it's going to happen in our house. That made it far more intense. And I had to be there for it. I remember when she started to feel the contractions. From the moment she felt contractions until Nathan was actually born, it was 28 hours. I remember that morning when she felt contractions, we thought it was so sweet, we woke up in the morning. She's like, I think, it's, I think it's happening. Oh, that's so sweet, it's happening, okay, great. We went for a walk, oh, it's so nice, we're gonna see our son soon. By the evening, it was a little more intense. She calls up the midwife, says it's time, I think it's time. Midwife says, let me speak to your husband. So I say, hey, I think it's time. You should come over now. She goes, it's not time. But she said it's time. She goes, nope, she's too chatty right now. I said, oh, oh, okay, all right, all right. Well, I mean, and I'll never forget, you know, they came over anyways, and, you know, they did all the measurements. They're like, you're not even close. And I'll never forget this. Iris is like, she just, she stopped even expressing pain because she knew she was so far off, she just shut it down and said, all right. But I remember in the middle of the night, the contractions are harder, and then she stopped talking. I'd be talking, are you okay? You're doing all right? And she'd just be rocking. She was rocking back and forth. She went into a whole other zone. By the time she gave birth to Nathan, I was so mesmerized by the power of women. This was during the time when people were having debates in our church about uh, should women be in ministry, could, could they be a pastor and all that stuff. And I just, after that moment, I was like, ladies, you are overqualified for any position. <laughs> pastor, president, <laughs> seriously. Nathan came forward, came forth and, and I was just, I, I told myself I would never be that dad who records. Like, who does this? I don't know how it happened, but I reached for my phone, I, I pushed the record button, and I'm watching it all, and I'm laughing and crying at the same time. It was beautiful. God was in that room. I see my son, I look at the time, and I said, this time is holy. 12.25 on a Tuesday. <laughs> Do you know the very next day at 12.25 I am celebrating his birth? Because Iris had worked and the birth process was completed and I'm now looking at creation and I see my son, his face, his eyes, I hear him and I am so moved that I want to commemorate the moment. And now every Tuesday is still special to me. Around lunchtime when y'all are eating, I'm like, unto us a child was born. <laughs> unto us a son was given. I celebrated the very next week. The next day at the exact time, the very next week on a Tuesday, and of course, we all celebrate, we all celebrate what? A year later, we all celebrate what? The birthday. We see Shin on the birthday. We will celebrate the child who did absolutely nothing to keep themselves alive. They did nothing to create themselves, they did nothing to sustain the life, and yet we are celebrating them and we're giving them more gifts. Every time Minton's birthday rolls around, I say, look at your mama, thank her. <laughs> Children, you should be writing checks to your parents on your birthday. Yet here we are, here we are, just like God, celebrating them. Oh, you're five years old. You're six. We're celebrating you. 
God rest, God rest, Adam and Eve enter into that rest, yet they had not worked for anything. The Sabbath for them in that moment had nothing to do with just needing a pause from their labors. And just so you know, we'll talk about this more next Sabbath, but just so you know, even when they did work, they never worked to the point where they were like, TGIF, thank God it's Friday. Right? They entered into a rest they did not earn. Adam and Eve entered into a rest they did not earn, and they were celebrated and honored for doing nothing but simply being present. And this is what we do. The very first Sabbath, the very first Sabbath was about not God being honored as creator, but God honoring his creation. I'm telling you this is so fundamentally different because I was raised, I was raised to say, this is the Sabbath day. God has given you six days to do whatever you want, but this is the one day he asked for, and you can't even get up on time and get to Sabbath school. Look at you. Look, y'all, y'all feeling that. You felt, you felt that, didn't you? <clears throat> but this is how I was raised. So I was raised to give God a Sabbath day because that's all he asked for. That's not what it says here. First of all, all of the days are God's days. All of them. All of them. He created all of them, right? But there's one day he gives to us. Not a day we give to him, a day that he gives to us that honors us. I am here to tell you that every seventh day Sabbath is your birthday celebration. If you look at Mark chapter 2, let's put that up there. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, verse 27. Jesus is being accosted by religious leaders about how and why he's healing on the Sabbath, and he has to educate them. And I love this verse. It's so succinct. He says that the Sabbath was made for who? Mankind, and not mankind for the Sabbath. This is so critical. The Sabbath was made for us, meaning that when God designed it all the way back in the Garden of Eden, it was for us. It was about us. It was the first gift of grace. I know many of you think that grace is simply synonymous with forgiveness. It has to involve sin. Grace simply means in scripture unmerited favor, meaning something you did not earn. The first Sabbath day was a gift that God gave to Adam and Eve and they did not earn it. They did not work for it. They did not deserve it. However you want to frame it, it was what God chose to give, unmerited favor. And next week we'll talk about how that got corrupted and why God in Exodus needed to remind his creation. But it's interesting because I will talk to people that say, but you Seventh-day Adventists, you keep the laws of the Jews. I'm like, no, we don't. They said, yes, you do. You keep the law of Moses. I'm like, no, I don't. They said, yes, yes, all the laws. I said, no, 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 no. Because I keep the Sabbath, you think I keep all of the law and I'm a legalist? Absolutely. I'd like to introduce just this one piece of information and then we'll walk away from this, okay? Watch this, watch this, watch this. When the Sabbath is first blessed and made holy, meaning that God set it apart, that's what the word holy means, to simply set it apart, to make it special. When he makes it holy, that means that from that point on, that day will always be special. It's not the moment that God is holding special. It is the day that he holds special. You understand the difference? It's not just the, if it was just the moment, God wouldn't have to bless it. He would simply say, I'm done. Props. Give myself a pat on the back. He goes beyond it. He rests on that day, but then he blesses it and makes it holy. And when uh, the, uh, the people of God would read the law and read this, they would know what it meant when God made something holy. Many people will argue, oh no, there was no Sabbath keeping from, from the beginning of Genesis all the way till we get to Exodus 2,500 years ago. I said, just because you don't hear about the Sabbath doesn't mean it wasn't there. When Joseph told Potiphar's wife, remember she slid into his DMs and was trying to you know, hit on him, and, and he says, I cannot sin against God, or against Potiphar in this way, what commandment was he quoting? What commandment was he breaking? There wasn't no thou shall not commit adultery, not literally written in stone yet, 
but it was still an understood principle of God, right? And that's why Joseph says, I cannot do this. I cannot do this. But this is what I tell people when they say it's a Jewish law. There were no Jews in Genesis chapter 2. Hello? There was no Moses in Genesis chapter 2. There were no Ten Commandments in Genesis chapter 2. Don't email me, oh, pastor was written in there. Stop it. Chill. We'll talk about this next week. I'm saying, Paul says the law was added because of sin. I'm telling you, the law in the way we understood it was not given at this time. There was no law. They were unaware of commandments and everything like this. Everything God had given them made sense to them. So they never had to think, oh, I have to be with her to have babies. Adam never had to question that kind of stuff. What should I eat? I'm going to eat what I'm designed for. It all made sense. And I'm telling you right now, when the Sabbath was given, there was no Moses. There were no Jews, no Hebrews, no Israelites, no Ten Commandments. Are you ready for this? No Moses. Are you ready for this? Here it comes. No sin. In a perfect world, in a perfect world where everything was good, God blessed the seventh day. So who are we to come around and say, oh, yeah, it's not that special. You remember when the kids stood up during children's story about their birthdays and we were going to say happy birthday? The only kids that really felt special were the kids in May, like me, May 31. <laughs> it's actually our month. We don't need to sing happy birthday to kids whose birthday's already passed. I mean, they stood up, they sang, but they don't feel the same as us May babies. I'm going to go one further on you. Even when they try to group us all together, all the May babies stand up. It's still not as special as May 31, <laughs> right? Wishing me happy birthday like on May 20. Come on. May 15. No, on my birthday, it's going to be more special because that's the day. So who are we to tell God? I know you thought it was special. I know it was probably very meaningful for you back in the day. But we decided to unholify it. We decided not to make it special anymore. In fact, we believe we can celebrate the birth any day we want to. You can do it. It just won't be as special. Watch it. It won't be as holy. So what God does at the beginning of time, at the beginning of our creation, is so incredibly special. God likes you. God likes the world. Everything about you is already complete, and that's why he can rest. I need to say this to you again. When you were born, everything about you was already special enough. There was nothing more you needed to do. God stands back and looks at you and says, this is my beloved. This is my baby girl. This is my baby boy. This is my child. This is so critical. The world will tell you, you need to do more. You need to add more. You need to work harder. And God can sit back and rest and say, it is good. It is good. It is good. This is where our starting point is. It's good. It's good. You're complete. You don't need anything more. I know that's hard because in us, the, the, the culture and the, and the governments we've been under, they, they tell us, no, there's more, there's more, there's more. And God, at the very beginning, gives Adam and Eve everything, and they never earned any of it. The Sabbath is our birthday celebration. You are complete. God likes you. God likes the world. And the seventh-day Sabbath becomes the very first holiday of planet Earth. The word holiday is a compound word. It means holy day. And every holiday, every major holiday, any holiday that really counts in our book, are the ones where we don't have to work. We get to rest. We get to eat good food. And we get to hang out with each other. I wonder where they got that idea from. <laughs> this started way back after God was finished, before there were Jews, before there were commandments, before 
there was sin. In a perfect world, God wanted to honor you. Worship is powerful. We'll get into that. We'll get into that component of worship. But I want you to know that worship is a two-way street. Worship also is a compound word. In the old English, it means worth-ship. Worth-ship. It's how we ascribe worth to someone. And when we think about worship, we think about ascribing worth to God. God, you are worthy. You are deserving. Look at the works of your hands, and we worship him for that. But you need to understand on the Sabbath day, God is also ascribing worth to his creation. You're my children. I listened to someone recently talk about the Sabbath, and they said the Sabbath is a reminder that we are, we are gods. But I'm going to go a step further. It's not simply a reminder that we are gods. It's a reminder that he is ours. How many scriptures have we read where God says, I will be your God? So on this Sabbath day, this very first Sabbath day, this very special holy day, this very first holiday, this birthday celebration that God celebrates every single week, and you couldn't stop him even if you wanted to, he's in love with you. He's going to still keep giving you gifts, even though you didn't even keep yourself alive, barely kept yourself alive, he's still going to give you gifts. And the very first gift he gives you is the Sabbath. So every week you can pause and be reminded that God is yours and you are his. And in him you are complete, lacking nothing. The Sabbath is a reminder of that beautiful grace, that unmerited favor, that gift. Let's bow our heads for the benediction. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for liking us, even when we haven't been likable. Thank you for taking the time this day to sit back and just enjoy us. We know we didn't earn it, but this is who you are and we thank you. Thank you for being our God. That we were fearfully and wonderfully made and that's what this day reminds us of. We're not an accident. We're not an afterthought. We didn't just explode by accident into existence. We were designed. And we thank you for that. Bless everyone here today. As our hearts are heavy, we also, we mourn with hope because we are marching to Zion. And yes, God, you are pretty likable too. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.